Hi folks, this is Nat, and this is going to be a video lesson on how we can represent combinations of things with a diagram, which is going to be a really important skill in probability, um, because one of the things we're always wondering when calculating probability is how many things can happen. That's going to be the basis of a lot of probabilities. If you know 15 things can happen, probably your probabilities are going to be based off of the number 15. Um, the other thing that uh, a good diagram of combinations can do besides tell us how many things can happen is that it can tell us what those things are exactly. It can tell us what outcomes are possible, which is a really nice thing to know, again, when we're trying to calculate probabilities. Let's begin our lesson here with an example. Let's say that in my closet I have seven shirts and four pairs of pants, and those are all of my clothes. And I want to know, what are the possible shirt-pant combinations? Or, in other words, how many different outfits can I wear with one shirt and one pair of pants? There are a couple really good ways to approach this problem. The first, uh, and the one that I actually personally like the best, is a chart, a table. The downside of a table is that it's only good for when there's only two, common, two things happening. So if you get to more than two things happening, like let's say I, was gonna, I had seven shirts, four pairs of pants, and three hats, and I wanted to combine all those, then it's a little less good. But when I've only got two things happening, a table's great. Here's what it'd look like. When I made the table, I'd make one set of rows and one set of columns, and I'd make it based on the number of choices I had in each category. So in this case, I set it up so that my shirts would go across the top, and my pants would go across the side. And in this case, I just have numbers. Um, I don't have any specifics about the shirts or the pants, so I'm just going to use the numbers again. I have one, two, three, four pairs of pants, and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven shirts. So I'd list my possibilities across each of the two axes, one down the rows, one down the columns. Um, everything in the box, rep every box in the chart represents a combination that's possible. So for example, this very first one represents the combination of shirt one with pant one. This one down here represents the combination of shirt one with pant two, shirt one with pants three, shirt one with pants four, and so on. Over here I've got shirt two with pants one, shirt two with pants two, shirt two with pants three, shirt two with pants four, and I could keep on going forever. And here's the completed chart. I actually went back and color-coded it so that the shirt numbers were all in black and the pants numbers were all in orange so that I wouldn't lose track of which is which. But what I can see here is that every box represents a possible combination. Um, and if I count up all the boxes or multiply the rows by the columns, I'll see that I have 35 possible outcomes and I know what all of these are now, and I can tell how likely each one is. So if I wanted to know what's the probability of picking an outfit that included a you know, shirt four, I'd say, well, here are all the outcomes that include shirt four, and there are four of them. So the probability of picking shirt four is going to be uh, four out of 35. And I'm just realizing I did not multiply correctly. That's not 35, it's 28. There are 28 possibilities. And so the probability of picking an outfit with uh, shirt 4 is 4 out of 28, which reduces down to 1 7th in simplest form. And that's how this sort of a diagram works. And this is not the best use of it because I probably could have figured that out a different way. Um, we'll get to a different way or a different scenario where this is really, really useful in a minute. But before that, let's look at an alternative. The alternative is what we call a tree diagram, and you see these a lot. A tree diagram has ultimately the same goal, to show me how many different combinations there are and what they all are, um, but it goes about it in a slightly different way. 
what I would do is start by listing one of my possibilities, one thing that I'm randomly picking. In this case, let's say I started with shirts. And again, I have the choice of shirt one, shirt two, shirt three, shirt four, five, six, or seven. I'm kind of running out of space, which is not ideal for a tree diagram. So we're going to reorient it the other direction. And when we make a tree diagram, after we've list listed one set of options, we list the other set of options in combination with the original ones. Now I'm moving on to pants. Well, I can have shirt one with pants one, two, three, or four. I can have shirt two with pant one, two, three, or four. I can have shirt three with the same stuff, and you're going to notice one of the limitations and the thing I don't like about tree diagrams here is that if you don't start with a ton of space, it gets really crowded and messy super fast. Um, so again, not ideal. I'm going to take a second to rework this and show you what it would look like if it was a little cleaner. So here's a finished and slightly cleaned up version. But what we can see here is that every branch of each tree represents a combination. So for example, shirt one can be combined with pants one, shirt one can be combined with pants two, shirt one can be combined with pants three or pants four, representing a combination of one, two, three, four different possibilities with an additional four on two, four on three, four on four, etc. Again, we can see all 28 different possible combinations of shirts and pants. Again, not my favorite, but it does have one advantage, and that's that if you have more than two things happening, you can still diagram them. Let's say again that I had some hats. If I had some hats, I could continue diagramming off each individual thing that I'd already made. So I could have shirt one with pants one with the spreading out combination of hat one and hat two. Or I could have shirt one with pants two and again the combination of either hat one or hat two. And again, I can keep making this diagram showing all the different extra combinations available to me now that I'm including two hats. And you can see again that this is getting really tight. But if I'd started with a little more space, I could really easy get, easily get this all done. And here's what that tree might look like when it was totally done. Again, the thing to note is that I can see all the different possible combinations. Um, and you can tell how many there are simply by counting this list on the bottom. Um, again, I could take shirt four, pants three, hat one. There's a combination. So a tree diagram can again show me all the different combinations available to me. Now, if you're thinking uh, efficiently, you might say to yourself, well, I don't need to diagram the entire thing to know how many combinations are available. Um, I can say, for example, well, there's seven shirts and there are four pairs of pants, and that's just going to be seven times four possible outcomes, or 28 outcomes. And you'd be right. Again, if you wanted to include the hats, you could say, well, there's just seven times four times two possible outcomes, which is 56 possible outcomes. And again, you would be right. Uh, the advantage of the diagram is not necessarily just to know what the outcome, how many outcomes are possible, but which outcomes are possible. And that is more important on some more complex problems. Let me show you one. Here's a really commonly misunderstood problem. You roll two six-sided dice. What could happen? Um, and people will typically say, well, 6 plus 6 makes 12, so 12 things can happen. Um, that is not the case. And doing a combinations diagram can really clearly uh, help us see why that isn't the case. So let's make a chart. Because I have two six-sided dice, six things can happen on each dice, so I'll list the numbers 1 through 6 in each of my rows and each of my columns.
So on the first dice, I could roll a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6. Or a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6 on the second dice. And let's say I'm adding these things together. Well, this is where the chart can be really helpful. A 1 and a 1 make a 2. A 1 and a 2 make a 3. And I'm going to fill this out, but it's going to be worth noting some patterns here, because I see a 1 and a 2 here and here, but I also see a 1 and a 2 here and here, so that's also going to make a 3. And I see a bunch of things, a 3 and a 1 make a 4, a 2 and a 2 make a 4, and a 1 and a 3 make a 4. So you're going to start to see, hopefully, some patterns emerging in the diagonals. The next diagonal will be 5, and then 6, and then the main big diagonal is going to be 7, and then we start getting down into bigger numbers, but fewer of them, because my diagonals are getting smaller. Now, these are all the things that can happen. And if we think back to our original problem, we originally said, well, it's two six-sided die. Well, maybe I can roll the numbers 1 through 12. The first thing we're going to see is that, one, that isn't true, because I can't even roll the number 1, because my two smallest numbers put together make 2. The other thing that we're going to see is that the chances of rolling every combination are not the same. I'm very unlikely to roll a 2 because there's only one way it can happen. I'm very unlikely to roll a 12 because there's only one way that it can happen. On the other hand, I'm very likely to roll a 7 because there's six different ways that can happen. And if I start thinking about my probabilities then, the probability of getting a 7 when I'm rolling 2 die is significantly higher than the probability of rolling a 2 or a 12. In fact, if you want to write the numbers, there's 36 things that can happen here, 36 different combinations, six of which are 7s and only one of which are 2s. So I have a 6 in 36 chance of getting a 7 and only a 1 in 36 chance of getting a 2 or a 12. So this is a scenario where making this chart of combinations is going to help me understand my probabilities a whole lot better. The other thing to note is that it's really the fastest way in this scenario to get all the different things that can happen. There's some, you know, calculations that I could come up with, but in all honesty, I'd still have to understand all the combinations. Um, so having them clearly diagrammed like this is going to make sure I don't miss any, um, and it's going to make it a whole lot easier in the long run. Here's another quick example. Let's say that I'm going to flip a coin three times, and I want to know how many outcomes contain at least one heads. Three things are going to happen. I'll have flip one. I'll have flip two. And I'll have flip three. And in this case, because I, three things are going to happen, I can't use a chart diagram. I'm going to have to use a tree diagram to see what all those different things are. Well, on flip one, I could have gotten a head or a tail. On flip two, I could have gotten a head or a tail. This is just a coin, so the choices are always heads or tails. And finally, on flip three again, I could have gotten heads or tails for each of the different things. First of all, this shows me that there are eight combinations of things that can happen, and I can see what each of those are. For example, heads, heads, heads. Then we've got heads, tails, or sorry, heads, heads, tails. We've got heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, tails, and so on. So now I can see all eight combinations, and I can really easily answer this question that may have been difficult initially. How many outcomes contain at least one head? And I can circle the ones maybe that I feel like fit that. There's one, there's two, three, four, five, six, seven, and in fact there's only one combination that doesn't contain at least one head, and that's tails, tails, tails. So if I want to know the probability of getting at least one heads when I flip a coin three times, it's going to be seven out of eight. And my tree diagram really helps me see that. 
Here are your practice problems for the lesson. So you're going to start by making a diagram for the two uh, different dice listed in problem one. And questions two and three will be about the diagram you created. Good luck. <laughs> 